Uh, so yeah, so I guess I should uh, change the title of my um, of my talks to von Neumann entropy, entropy in quantum field theory. I'm not actually going to do that just because entanglement entropy rolls off the tongue, and I'm not going to change my my ways that easily. Um, but this is the plan. So the first lecture, I'm going to give uh, some background. Uh, there'll actually be quite a bit of overlap between what has already been said uh, by Matt and by Edward. Um, basically, I want to expand a little bit on what they're saying, so I have to uh, revisit some of it. Um, in the second lecture, I'll talk um, about replica methods. Uh, so this is some particular way to do some computations uh, of entanglement entropy in, in quantum field theory, um, sort of in the continuum limit. Um, and in lecture three, I'll talk about some applications. Uh, I'm not sure how, how many I'll get to talk about, but I promise that uh, I will mention, uh, I, I will discuss the entropic C theorems, because uh, they're sort of an important uh, uh, result. Um, OK, so the first lecture. So let's continue with the fiction that the quantum field theory Hilbert space factorizes. <laughs> um, OK, so this is, this is literally true uh, if we have some lattice regulator. So we have some region A. Uh, and then you know, if I zoom in very close, I have some lattice uh, on some size. Uh, with some lattice spacing epsilon, then of course the Hilbert space is just a, a product of Hilbert spaces on the different vertices, or um, and then there's a clear split between the two, uh, the Hilbert space of A and, and its complement, A and A complement. Um, of course, the dimension of this Hilbert space grows exponentially in the volume of the region. So we're going to take uh, this, you know, we're, we're going to imagine this system, and we want to take the continuum limit. So we want to hold fixed this region A. We want to hold fixed fix its size, for example, and take the cutoff uh, epsilon to zero. Uh, and when we do that, we, you know, the dimension of the Hilbert space scales exponentially in the volume. Uh, but we're only going to be interested in special states. Uh, that if you like, sort of by definition, uh, exist you know, uh, in the continuum limit. Uh, and so for example, they have finite energy density in that limit, um, et cetera. And in particular, they have universal short distance correlations. So for example, if we're studying, you know, maybe we're studying a free, a free field on the lattice, uh, then you can look at the, the two-point functions of the field operators. Uh, and this is sort of in any state that we want to we wanna study in this class. Uh, and at short distances, there'll be some divergence, some power law divergence uh, like this, uh, in particular in the limit where x is much bigger than the cutoff, uh, but much smaller than, say, 1 over the mass of this field. Um, OK, so it's these uh, short distance correlations uh, that l lead to divergences in entanglement entropy. And in particular, these short distance correlations only act or only give entanglement near, near the entangling surface. So we can now zoom in to the entangling surface. Um, zoom. Uh, here it is, the boundary of A. Um, and in particular, we're going to make some assumption that the uh, correlations on different length scales are, are you know, you know, on you know, vast, you know, very different length scales are independent. So we have some correlations, and the only correlations that are important are the ones that go across the entangling surface. So we have some uh, correlations that are very big, uh, and then we have correlations that are smaller, and then smaller and smaller, and so forth. Um, and it's this. Uh, uh, sort of the, these correlations on this uh, arbitrarily small scale that leads to uh, divergences in the entanglement entropy. And based on this picture, we can estimate, so let me estimate the entanglement entropy of A, at least the divergent piece, as some, uh, let me go to the next board. As some integral 
some contributions on various length scales. So L is my length scale of this excitation of this correlation. L here. Um, and this integral goes from the cutoff to some other, some other IR cutoff, for example. Uh, it could be the length, the size of the system, or one over the mass. Um, and then, because this is local to the entangling surface, you can basically do dimensional analysis. And so you have an integral of a y, which is on the entangling surface. Uh, and then you can just basically put, uh, the idea is that you can uh, put here various geometric quantities and use dimensional analysis to figure out what power of L you should put in front of those geometric quantities. And so these geometric quantities are determined by the shape of the entangling surface. If we decide to study things on curved space, then they'll, they'll depend on the, the, um, the Riemann tensor of the, of the background. Um, uh, okay, so the first term is just a constant. I'll call it alpha d minus two. And so because we're integrating over d minus two dimensions, this, this sorry, my field theory is in d space-time dimensions. Uh, and because we're integrating over a co-dimension two surface here, uh, I have to put in here a factor of L d minus two. Uh, and then there are other terms. For example, there's one at d minus four, which depends uh, on the you know, geometric quantities at the, the location y. And then I have some other power and dot, dot, dot. And all the way to alpha zero, uh, which, has, um, which is made of geometric quantities with dimension d minus two. Okay, so then I don't need to put any factors here. Um, and so this is the form of the entanglement entropy. Uh, and then of course there's a finite piece. So alpha zero depends on log l? Oh, well, Ah, yeah, yeah, right, I haven't integrated yet. Um, and so this, this integral is sort of motivating where that log comes from. Um, Okay, so the, a few comments. So this is, this is what people usually write down, but actually there are more terms and you should be, you know, should be aware of it, although I'll sort of only mention it and then we'll specialize to these, these terms. Um, uh, let me play this game. So, so, uh, so other dimensions can arise. Um, I'm not going to give a complete list, but there's a particularly sort of uh, troublesome one, which is that if you have some other relevant operators, operators in the CFT, uh, then they can appear as VEVs in the state, and then you have some L to some power nu. Um, and this was studied by, well, this was sort of systematically studied by Maroff and Wall. Um, and in particular, this is a, 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 a sort of a, a bad example because it's state dependent, right? So the VEV depends on the state. Uh, and otherwise, I'm going to claim that these, these, these objects are state independent. So they're the same in any state that you choose. Um, Okay, but you, you should be aware of these. Uh, and okay, very good. Uh, and um, okay, so let's specialize to the geometric quantities. Uh, I should say that there are ways to remove these terms if you look at quantities that you know Ed Edward has talked about, uh, such as relative entropy. Then these go these go away. Okay, so the. Um, the various terms in this expansion, well, uh, they're made up of uh, you know, the Riemann tensor and the extrinsic curvature to various powers. And in particular, you can only have even powers of the extrinsic curvature. So schematically, they're of this form. Um, so our, okay, so again, we're assuming that we're, we're not, maybe not working on a flat background. The extrinsic curvature, if I have some co-dimension two surface, 
uh, in, in space-time, then there are two normal directions. So this is, say, one time-like nt and one space-like nx, and these are vectors. So these are normal vectors uh, at the point y. And um, you can define two extrinsic curvatures to this surface. OK, alpha, so alpha is labeling t or x here uh, as just derivatives of these normal vectors projected onto the surface. So if this surface is de defined by some function x mu of y, I, then p mu i is just the partial derivative of x mu. So these are the extrinsic curvatures. And the reason they can only appear as squared, well, there's actually two reasons. I can give you two reasons. Um, so the first reason is uh, in, in the ultraviolet, the theory should be boost invariant. In particular, it should be boost invariant around the entangling surface, around this direction. And so I have this free index here, and so I have to contract it with something. And the only way to do that is if I square it. So I have combinations like this, okay, alpha, KL. Uh, the other reason is that, at least for pure states, we also know that for pure states, S of A is S of A complement. And if you assume that the contribution is state independent, then we can study this in, in the vacuum, which is a pure state. Uh, and the, um, the difference between S of A and S of A complement in terms of these divergent terms is just get, got by flipping the sign of these, these normal vectors. So kappa goes to mi minus kappa. And so that means you can't have linear terms. Otherwise, they would violate this relation. Um, OK, yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, either, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I should have said that, yeah. So you, you have, you can also, you can talk about the curvature of the background manifold, which is at this location y, but you can also talk about the curvature of the extrinsic, you know, of the, the intrinsic curvature of this surface, uh, and they both will appear, although they're related. Um, okay. All right, so uh, let me give, um, so, right, so let me discuss the most interesting term here, which is this alpha naught. So when we integrate dl over l, we get this log uh, divergence. Uh, and this log divergence is somehow the most robust thing. In particular, all of these other terms are somehow scheme dependent. They depend what regulator you pick these coefficients. Um, so let's discuss alpha 0. Uh, let me So alpha 0, um, so, OK, so let, let, let me say it this way. So I, in, in, this, in this expansion, there's two interesting terms. There's alpha 0 and s finite. So let me first discuss alpha 0. So alpha 0, um, OK, so firstly, it gives rise to log divergences, so you have log L of epsilon or log C of epsilon. Um, and uh, let me give three examples. OK, so the first example you've seen already in two dimensions. Alpha 0, you can calculate using CFT methods for Right, so at this point, I'm going to specialize to CFTs, so quantum field theories that don't have a scale, uh, plus some extra things. But uh, let's, so if we specialize to this case, then we can use CFT methods to calculate this. And you find this term is alpha, uh, alpha naught is C over 6. Uh, and then, because, you know, if I look at an interval in a 
2D CFT, um, then there's two points that I have to do this analysis, analysis at, or if you like, the area is two, uh, and so this gives two times C over six log L of epsilon, and this is the formula you've seen before. Um, the second example, sorry, uh, the, the next case is in four dimensions, uh, where alpha naught you can show has two terms, one over two pi times a, which is the trace anomaly coefficient, and c, or one of them, and this is the other one. Uh, and so the a, a type uh, coefficient multiplies uh, just the, um, the intrinsic curvature of the two dimensional surface. So in four dimensions, the surface is two dimensional. Um, and then the C type coefficient multiplies some coefficient, uh, uh, which depends on the Riemann tensor of the background and some combinations of extrinsic curvature squared. I'm not going to write these out because I don't find them very enlightening, but you can see, uh, see ex explicit expressions. Uh, for example, in Solidukin, who you know, worked this out first. Um, so one interesting thing about these two coefficients is that if I pick, so these, you know, they depend on the surface. So let, let, let me take flat space and let me look at a sphere. Uh, for example, then in, in, in the sphere case, this term vanishes and you get only this term. And if I look at an infinite cylinder in flat space, then this term vanishes and you only get this term. So that's one way to isolate these two different terms. Um, the other example uh, is in three dimensions. So in three dimensions, naively, there's no, there's no co coefficient here. So there's nothing I can put here because of this, you know, this fact that I can only have even powers of the extrinsic curvature and uh, the Riemann tensor. And one thing I didn't say is that dimensionally, R has dimension two and the extrinsic curvature has dimension one. So these are only even dimensional uh, objects. And, yeah, that's right. Um, th th that's also a little bit of a lie, but yeah. So it depends on your regulator. Um, but if you pick a nice regulator, then that's true. Uh, okay. So the term that arises in three dimensions uh, is you can have surfaces that have corners in them. Um, and if a surface has a corner in it, then you know, there's some new geometric quantity associated to that corner. So to each, uh, so for example, so in, in three dimensions, um, in three dimensions, you can have some corner like this. Uh, so the surface is one dimensional in that case, and there's some angle here. Uh, and at each point, say you have a surface with many different corners, then the log term is a sum over these different points. And then there's some function which depends on the angle. And this, in general, depends on the, you know, the CFT, uh, the particular CFT, this function. Uh, and then you also get a log, to, to, log term, sorry. This is alpha naught. And then when you integrate it, it gives you a log term. Yeah, so I, I think I, I, I misspoke. I'm, when I say the alpha zero term, I mean there's a coefficient, there's a log divergence in the, CF, in, in the 3D CFT, which is like this. Yeah. Uh, so, um, no, I mean this, this well, okay, so th this you have to do, yeah, so th yeah, that's right. I mean, I'm assuming some local expansion at the surface, and here you have to treat this point differently. Yeah. Um, okay, so, uh, so th these, these new divergences are important. For example, if we, uh, uh, let me, this is, These uh, new divergences, so these log divergences are important. So for example, if I think about 
two spheres, two circles. The entangling surface is two circles that intersect, and one of these circles is A and the other one is B. Um, then you can compute co some combination of entropies that looks like this. So A, A and B, and then the subtract off the union and the intersection. Um, and this is, you know, this is the SSA. This is strong subadditivity. This is a strong subadditivity like quantity. And you know, in particular, you notice that locally the divergences cancel in each of these terms uh, fr from you know, the divergence, the area law divergence from here and here. However, the corner terms only arise in the intersection here and they do not cancel. So corner terms. So somehow this SSA does not have a continuum limit in that case, because you get log divergences. Um, OK, so this is the log divergent terms. Um, but uh, there's also another interesting term, which is S finite. And this is really where you know, a lot of the physics is. Um, Uh, it, it, it implies some constraint on this co coefficient. This is a function. There's some opening angle here. There's certainly a, there are certainly strong constraints on this function. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you have to work it out. Yeah. Um, OK, so uh, the finite term, well, OK, so let, let me explain one interesting consequence of the finite term. So the, um, the finite term, if I take the state to be vacuum and I pick a sufficiently nice regulator, then the finite term makes sense. And so let's say let's work in three dimensions. Um, and we take A to be a ball. Then again, you can use conformal met methods, uh, CFT methods, to show that this finite term is related to the uh, log of the partition function of the CFT on S3. And this is sometimes called minus f. Um, and of course, it's interesting that the various coefficients that appear here, c, a, and f, you know, all have some kind of uh, monotonic behavior under our G-flow. Uh, and so this is not a coincidence. And I'll discuss this uh, in a little bit. But in, one thing to notice is that they all arise for, for, for ball, ball, ball regions. So A is a ball here uh, for the ball case or the, the entangling surface being a sphere. This term vanishes, so you get this term. And in two dimensions, there's just a line, which is sort of a sphere. Uh, a ball. Um, OK, so that's one example of S finite, how it's interesting. Uh, however, you know, I, I would like to say that S finite in general, you know, you have, um, in general, this is for any state. So S finite depends on all sorts of things. Uh, S finite depends on, you know, uh, the region A. It depends on the state. It depends on the theory. It depends on all sorts of things. And so, for example, um, for example, in four dimensions, you might say S finite doesn't make any sense because there is, if you integrate this, you get this log divergence in four dimensions. And so if I change my cutoff by scaling it, for example, then that will change S finite. But of course, it changes S finite in a very particular way, which depends on these geometric quantities. Uh, and, and so if I vary any of these other quantities, then I can make sense of S finite. OK. And so I, a, lot of, a lot of what I've, what I've focused on in studying entanglement in quantum field theory is trying to extract interesting stuff from this. OK. Um, OK, so let's talk about strategies for that. in some way, shouldn't I? Uh, OK, that wasn't very good. <sighs> OK.
Okay, so how do we, how do we ex you know, extract something from S finite? Well, there's a, there's a few ways that you could imagine doing this. So one way is to compute the change in entanglement entropy, say, between two different states, S psi minus the vacuum. Um, this, this sometimes is fine. But of course, you have this issue that there were sometimes state-dependent divergences, and they don't cancel here. Um, so, so you know, it could be state-dependent divergences, although you know these don't often arise, but sometimes they do. Uh, there's another way to extract this term, uh, and that is to use the relative entropy. So, if I take two states, rho a and sigma a, um, as Edward discussed. So this is the reduced density matrix associated to the state psi, and this is the reduced density matrix associated to the vacuum in region A. Uh, then, at least continuing with this fiction, where I can talk about density matrices, you can make the following manipulations on this quantity. So this is the definition of the relative entropy. Uh, basically, if you add and subtract, uh, if you add and subtract, so to subtract sigma a log sigma a, and then, so I'm adding this, I have this other term, minus trace rho a log sigma a, and then I add this. So this is just a rewriting of this. Um, then these two terms, these two contributions can be written uh, like we continue here as, well, what is this? This is, uh, this is the entropy of the vacuum and this is the entropy of psi. Um, so the first term is delta S uh, minus, uh, sorry, is delta S. Uh, sorry, I, uh, did I do something wrong here? Minus, minus. minus delta S. Uh, yeah, there's various minus signs running around here. Yes, yes, minus delta S, very good. Uh, um, and uh, the second term, well, what is it? So it has log sigma A, log sigma A in both of it. So we define this modular Hamiltonian Okay, a uh, minus log sigma a. So this is the vacuum vacuum modular Hamiltonian, which um, Matt has talked about. And then what is what is this? This is just minus, uh, plus the change in the modular Hamiltonian expectation value of the change in the modular Hamiltonian. Where I let me just be a little bit explicit about that. That just means the um, that just means psi ka psi minus the vacuum version. Okay, and you can write this, sorry, I, I wrote this um, as expectation values in the original state, but then you can also just write this as traces. So this is minus trace ka rho a minus trace ka sigma a. Okay, so in this case, we can sort of uh, extract, you know, so we, we, we can hope to use at least the change in the entropy here if we have some independent expression for Ka, and uh, there are many situations where we do actually have an independent expression for Ka. Matt Hedrick has uh, already mentioned one, uh, and I'll, I'll mention a few in this, in this class. Um, okay, um, and in particular, you know, I should have said, so. Um, the, the relative entropy we expect to have a nice continuum description. Uh, well, it, it does have a continuum definition. Uh, the question becomes, I'm, I'm using this fiction at some intermediate step in this calculation. Uh, the question is, uh, does the fiction reduce to the precise definition using the Iraqi formula? Um, so, good. Um, Right, so, um, let, okay, let me say a few words about that. Um, so, you know, my philosophy for this fiction is that uh, where, 
Um, so my, my philosophy for, for this fiction is that it's nice to do calculations. I like to do calculations. Um, and sometimes the only way to do calculations is to put in some kind of regulator uh, and compute these quantities where you can literally think of it as a trace uh, and compute this relative entropy in that way. Um, and, and so um, at the end of the day, if we want to use algebraic quantum field theory ideas like proofs, proofs of monotonicity of relative entropy and so forth, then what we have to do is establish that we've, you know, we've, uh, um, the quantity that we calculate, so firstly, we want to calculate a quantity uh, using, using this fiction, and then we want to write it in terms of something which has a well-defined, which we expect has a well-defined continuum limit. Um, and so, you know, it at least has a chance that the quantity that we calculated is the continuum quantity. Now, I think in some situations, you still need to work to prove that. Um, uh, but yeah, so uh, you know, I like to do calculations, and using uh, you know algebraic methods to do calculations is hard, and I, I don't think has been developed very well. Um, okay, so good. Uh, all right, so there's another way that people have discussed to extract this finite term. Uh, So um, that is to use to look at something like the mutual information. Um, right, so the mutual information is this quantity. And if, at least if you take regions that are non-intersecting, then using this, this argument about the local divergences, you can see that they cancel. Uh, as Matt has uh, has already suggested, so uh, divergences um, between these guys. Uh, actually, there's sort of there's a different argument that I'd like to that I'd like to give that that's sort of been emphasized by Horacio Cassini uh, for why you might think uh, the mutual information has a has a nice continuum limit. Um, so, so let's think. Let's think about the case where we have a lattice regulator, uh, and we consider some uh, spherical region A. Let's say A here. Um, then it's possible on this. You know, so we have some lattice here, and some very fine scale epsilon. Um, then it's possible to pick, uh, make a different choice for what you mean by this region A. You can, in particular, you can sort of you know, cut the lattice in various ways. You can think about taking sort of wiggly cuts. Right. So this is all on the scale of the lattice. Uh, so in principle, as you take the continuum limit, this scale goes to 0, and these regions should be treated the same. Right? However, the entanglement entropy, which you know, has this area divergence, is clearly very different between these two cases. So for the wiggly case, so this is, let, let me call this K, case A, A, W. And so the area of A, W, of the boundary of A, W, is clearly much bigger in some sense than the area of the boundary of A. Uh, and so the divergence will change dramatically. So in particular, this coefficient will go to some other coefficient. Um, so, uh, and this, this, is, this, you know, this is related to the, the fact that entanglement entropy doesn't need to be monotonically decreasing as I change the region size. Um, so as I sort of move the region size in, uh, then you know, because, of, because of entanglement, uh, you can, you know, you're, you're, you're asking about how much entanglement is between here and here. As you move the region in, you can you know, cut new EPR pairs and make the entanglement grow. Um, <clears throat> However, the mutual information has a nice monotonicity property, which is that if I take some reference system B here, then the mutual information of A 
with B, because A is bigger than the AW region, uh, should be bigger than AW with B. And so this is monotonicity of mutual information, which follows from strong subadditivity. And we can take another spherical region, which sort of sits in here, and bound it by that spherical region, A prime B. Then in the continuum limit, you expect these two things to go to the same quantity, uh, right? Again, because you know, as you send this lattice spacing to zero, this goes to zero. So these you treat as the same region in the continuum limit. So these go to the same quantity, and because this is bounded between those two, this should also go to the same quantity. So this is at least suggesting that various ambiguities that you can introduce at the, the scale of the lattice uh, should be insensitive in the mutual information. So you should be insensitive to those ambiguities in the mutual information. Um, sorry? Uh, well, I guess then you would get a divergence, so yeah, I, I, um, I'm not sure. Uh, well, I, you know, you can sort of think of these as corners, right? You're introducing a bunch of corners at the level of the lattice. Well, so, yes. I don't know. I have to think about that case. But, but I, I, I would say that you know. At the level of the lattice, sort of when you try to, if you try to do these entanglement entropy computations, you have to make some choices for what you mean by a sphere. Uh, and in some sense, you're introducing a whole bunch of corners. So then you, you're, cha you know, you're changing the answer dramatically because uh, of divergences associated to corners. Uh, and that's the answer for the entanglement entropy, but the mutual information should be fine. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I, I think this is suggestive. I don't think this is a, this is not a proof or anything, but I think it's suggestive that using these sort of monotonicity like arguments, you can try to, uh, make some statements more precise where you're approximating the, the continuum theory by, you know, a series of, uh, theories with a tensor factor, pro, uh, factorization, uh, and, um, it, you know, at least using this monotonicity property, you, you can have, you, you can imagine that there's nice uh, behaviors for certain quantities like mutual information and, and relative entropy. And uh, so the, the relative entropy argument is the same. Um, okay. And, and I, I think, you know, this should be in the future at least used to may, maybe make some of these arguments more rigorous. Um, okay, so any questions so far? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yes. Yes. Uh, in in these systems in the continuum limit, the entanglement entropy is is never well defined. Yes. So the various terms in the entanglement entropy might be well defined, uh, but yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, all right. So. The next topic I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, I, I'm going to revisit uh, using path integral methods. Uh, it, yeah. Uh, so no, so I, B is just some reference, right? So I'm not actually trying to calculate the entanglement entropy. It's, I just want to sh show this is finite now. Uh, um, one thing you can do is you can imagine uh, taking A and B to be A and B, something like this. So B is sort of everything outside of a circle, uh, and A is everything inside of a circle. Um, then, if you know, at least if your state is pure, then um, you, you might expect that this is sort of a good approximation to the entanglement entropy because, you know, at least if I call this d scale delta, um, because of purity, so S of A is equal to, sorry, S of, let me write it this way, S of B is S of B complement, which is then a circle which is, you know, has a very similar area to this circle. 
And so if I take delta to be small, this is approximately S of A. Um, and in particular, S of AB, which is sort of everything except this strip, is the same as S of this strip. And as I send delta, delta to zero, you might expect that uh, the contribution from that strip is small. So uh, you know, a, a possible regulator for entanglement entropy is that I say S should be replaced with the mutual information of AB like this over two. Now, um, this is, you know, the, the, the this is um, in the limit delta goes to zero. You, you know, you might expect to go back to something like this, and it sort of makes it, it sort of makes sense, right? Because as delta goes to zero, actually the mutual information has various divergences, and those divergences should look very similar to this. However, now because the mutual information has a continuum limit, as long as delta is much bigger than the lattice scale, this sort of expansion that you would write for this mutual information, all of the terms in the expansion are completely well defined. Um, so, this is, you know, so this is an idea for, for one way to regulate uh, entanglement entropy in the continuum limit. Of course, then the onus is to show that this has the same properties as this, uh, which you know, may or may not be true. Uh, um, Okay. Uh, any other questions? Yes. In, in what case does it tend to scale differently with distance in the correlator? Uh, so you're asking about, because uh, uh, I said that in a free theory it goes like this power. Is that what you're asking about? The, the correlator goes like this? Yeah. No, so that power, that, that power is different. So I, th this is not true. So, so th this was an example I said. Uh, I should emphasize if I have a, a, any sort of UV CFT, so interacting CFT, then the correlators do not scale like this. They scale like other powers. Then you still expect this, this expansion. So you expect L to the D minus 2. There might be these other operators that can arise, these state-dependent operators. But otherwise, you expect a similar expansion to this. Oh, sorry. I, I misunderstood. Yeah, I'll mention that later. Yeah. I imagine this is like a non-local version of the correlation between two regions. Yeah. So, so actually, it's a it's a great version of the correlation between yeah. two regions because it's sort of all correlations. Um, so I'll I'll talk about that later. So the question was about I misunderstood the question. The question was about you know what happens when you have two regions like this, uh, A and B then indeed the mutual information is related to correlation functions. And I will, uh, I will talk about that in later and it's lectures. Than just the average. Yeah, it's more complicated. Um, you, get, you actually get the square of the correlators. So. OK, uh, uh, other questions? Uh, yeah, so, so, um, but I'm fixing B. So B is the same always, right? So, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not changing B in that argument, so. Yeah, I, I guess maybe what you could, what, you, what you're asking is, I could reverse the argument and do it for B, and then fixing A, and then it would be the same. It would be the same story. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, so let, let me move on. So, I'm going to talk about uh, path integrals for subregions, which Edward has also already done, but I, I, it was a little bit, you know, he, he was very quick. So, I, I would like to expand upon that a little bit. So, I apologize for the repetition. Uh, um, I sorry? I didn't do path I, I know you didn't. I didn't say you did. <laughs> <laughs> Edward, at the, for the last 10 minutes of, of, his, of his second lecture, talked about path integrals, and, and I, I'm, I'm going to go over that again. Um, OK, so uh, very good. Um, 
this is very complicated. <laughs> uh, this is very confusing to me, actually. <laughs> ah, I feel like I'm not using things very well. OK, let me try. <laughs> What's the best strategy? Someone who has already talked. Oh, I should push that out first, right? Very good, yes. I was told that I couldn't do it with my hand. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> We've got this here now. So. Keep going. Ah. <laughs> okay. All right. So. Okay, so path integrals. For subregions, okay, so subregions I mean A for or A complement or whatever or various regions. So th this is sort of a, 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 a you know somewhat general method, um, and uh, we can exploit it in various ways. Uh, so there's two ways we can exploit. We can exploit symmetries, and then the next way we can you, you, uh, we can use it with the replica trick, and so that'll be the subject of tomorrow's lectures. So. Um, OK, so we take some time slice, say t is 0, let's say just in Minkowski space. Uh, and then we think of sort of a basis of states as uh, field configurations on this t is 0 slice. So t is 0. Um, and then we can think, then we can use this uh, to think about wave functionals of some state that we, we might be interested in. So, so the state is psi. Um, and uh, OK, and so the path integral computes, um, basically computes transition amplitudes between these field configurations. So path integral, integral, um, so transition amplitudes where you evolve with a Hamiltonian between two different field configurations like this is some path integral where we have the action of the quantum fields. And then the boundary condition is such that minus, at minus t, I have phi of x prime. And at 0, I have phi of x. Okay, so this is this configuration and this configuration. So I guess I'm doing the path integral to t is 0, and I'm starting at some minus t here. And I have some field configuration here. Uh, this should be x prime. Phi of x. Um, OK, so now. Uh, well, uh, one, you know, uh, one nice thing that the path integral gives you is a way to compute um, uh, ground states. And uh, so to do that, we just take it and we wick rotate. So it to minus t. So this is wick rotation. Uh, and then this time evolution for large t projects onto the vacuum. Um, so, yeah, it's not so bad. <laughs> okay, so it projects onto the vacuum. So, in particular, if I take E now e to the minus ht uh, on some state phi prime of x, and then I insert a complete set of states of energy eigenstates. This goes like e to the minus t e e e phi prime of x, 
and the thing that survives is the lowest energy, um, right? The, in the limit t goes to infinity, the lowest energy uh, um, survives, which is the vacuum. And so t goes to plus infinity up to some normalization. This goes to the vacuum state times some stuff, right? So that stuff in this case depends on this field configuration, but it won't be important for us. So we're going to ignore this. Basically, you hold fixed this boundary condition, uh, and then we vary. So we're going to hold fixed the bottom boundary condition, and we vary the top boundary condition. And in the limit, t goes to infinity. The bottom boundary condition doesn't matter. So then we have an integral representation, a path integral representation for the ground state, which looks like this. If I have x, ground state, maybe I'll use omega for ground state. This path integral from Euclidean time is minus infinity to phi of x, d phi. And now, because we've wick rotated, we just have the Euclidean action. OK. Um, right, so then, good. Um, now let's consider, so this is for, for this, for this, you know, uh, this is for the bra, the, the, but you know, we, we want to talk about density matrices, so we need two of these, and we need the Hermitian conjugate of this. Uh, and then we're going to put these two path integrals together. When we take the Hermitian conjugate, in Euclidean, you flip from negative Euclidean time to positive Euclidean time. So then we have to put two things together. Um, So we put two of these things together. Maybe I'll, I'll draw it here. Uh, and this is just pictorially. So in particular, we're going to calculate 5x, this thing here. But then we're also going to have the, the, um, the bra. And then this looks like a path integral from minus Euclidean time to t is 0. So this is the t is 0 surface, uh, where we impose some boundary condition on the field configuration phi of x. And here, we impose a boundary condition phi prime of x. So this is a representation for this guy, which is then just matrix elements of the, of the density matrix for this state, which is pure. Um, but now, we take the Hilbert space at t is 0 to factorize into some HA, HA complement. And in particular, you take field configurations to factorize. So phi of x is some um, phi of A complement of x, tensor phi of A of x, where these two field configurations sum up to this. And they're 0 on the various components. So this is 0 on the A component, and this is 0 on the complement component, the A complement. Um, OK, and then we're going to do this for both of these. And then we're going to trace over A complement. Right? And so tracing over A complement, uh, so trace over A complement corresponds to doing a uh, integration over the field configurations, phi a complement uh, at t is equal to 0. So these are field configurations just at t is equal to 0. And what that effectively does is glue. So we split these two up into various pieces. We have a, a complement, a complement. And what this integral does is just glue together the two path integrals here and here. And so you're just left with this little cut here. So you glue these together like this. You, sorry. Let me redraw this.
Okay, let me redraw that picture to be clear. So then that picture is basically uh, gluing this together it means you just do, you allow the path integral just to go through this section and then you're left with two cuts here and here with boundary conditions on the cut uh, which are basically phi a prime and phi a and so the remaining path integral which is now defined in the full uh, Euclidean plane except for along these cuts um, gives you matrix elements of the reduced density matrix for A. So in particular, you get phi A of X rho A phi A complement. X. Um, okay, so this is sort of our final pictorial representation uh, for the reduced density matrix. It's this path integral, uh, there's no boundary conditions across here, no boundary conditions across here, but then you impose these boundary conditions here and here. Um, sorry, thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, okay, but you, you can already see from this path, in, you know, this path integral that there's going to be significant issues at the boundary here. Okay, and those issues that I'm sort of just Ignoring are the UV divergence issues. So those are the you know that's that's where the uh, di you know um, the uh, divergences in the entanglement entropy are going to come from. Uh, one option that you have um, is to just cut these out. So you just put a little hole here, like this, and you do it at some scale, which you call epsilon suggestively, uh, very close to the entangling surface. So these two points, I should say, are the entangling surface because they're the boundary of A. Uh, and, and the other thing I should say is I'm just drawing in two, dimen two dimensions. Uh, however, this, this works in, in arbitrary dimensions, okay? Um, but when you cut this out, you need, to, you, you need to do something with these boundaries, right? So you need to in, in, impose, impose boundary conditions uh, at the circle. Uh, and so you can do that, but then there's clearly some arbitrariness with what you do there. Uh, and yeah. Um, okay, but th th this, is, this has a name. This is called the hard wall cutoff. It's just the hard wall cutoff. So this is another regulator. Um, okay, so now. Uh, um, now we can sort of redraw this picture by thinking of doing the path integral in a slightly different way. So here we're doing the path integral along time slices like this. And that was giving us projecting onto the ground state, projecting onto the ground state. Um, but now, basically, we can choose to slice open the path integral in various ways. When we do that, we associate to co-dimension one surfaces, like these, these, these lines here, uh, Hilbert spaces. And so the path integral just gives you time, uh, so it gives you some evolution between those Hilbert spaces. Um, and okay, yeah, this is very bad. <laughs> so bad at this. Okay, so then, uh... okay, so now I can sl choose to slice open the path integral in a different way. Um, follows. So you draw the following picture. Now I can pick slices that look like this. Now there's some issue here. 
uh, because you know when I do when I'm going to do the path integral. Uh, so I'm imagining doing the path integral between these various slices, and at some point I have to flip the slice from top to bottom. Uh, and so you might argue that there's some issue there. At least for a CFT, it's it's easy to map this under a conformal transformation to the sphere. Uh, and then th this picture is totally fine. Right? So then you can define these slices and everything is fine. Um, but then when you do this, what you get is actually, uh, you know, then you can use standard methods to rewrite the path integral in some operator formalism. Uh, but instead of getting uh, just some uh, Hamiltonian evolution, you're going to get something where the Hamiltonian is effectively time dependent. Because on each of these slices, the time evolution varies as you move around. So I'm thinking of this as being some angular direction theta that you can label. And then, you know, based on this, your density matrix looks some, well, now because your Hamiltonian is time dependent, you have to have some time ordering and say that this angle goes from 0 to 2 pi here, h of theta, d theta. Let me just call this k of theta. Um, and so this is another, right, so then this gives you explicit representation for the density matrix like this. Um, and I, the reason I, I, I wanted to sort of, uh, sort of mention this is because there are some things, you know, uh, Sometimes people have treated uh, things incorrectly in this picture. So, for example, later on we're going to try to take powers of density matrices, uh, and it's certainly not true that this is the time order of this guy. This is just not true. I shouldn't write it. Um, however, when alpha is an integer, there's a strategy and that's using replica methods. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, we'll talk about that later. For now, I just want to think about the case where there's some symmetry that moves you from these different slices. And so if there's a symmetry, uh, then in fact the, the, you know, the Hamiltonian is time independent. And then indeed, you can write rho A is e to the minus 2 pi k, where k is some symmetry generator. Um, okay. And so then this just becomes like usual time evolution. Uh, uh, okay, so then, you know, the easiest case is Rindler space. So, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I, I should be careful. I should really be very careful here. Um, so, yeah, I'm not being very careful. So, so Ka, so actually sometimes, you know, so, so in the general case, you know, you can also talk about uh, the modular Hamiltonian, which is just defined as a minus up to 2 pi log of the reduced density matrix. And so in that case, you would take log of this operator. And that's fine. Um, and then when you take powers of it, obviously you get e to the alpha k, right? And that's fine, uh, but it's not this, and that's what I wanted to say. Um, okay, but in this case, in the symmetric case, k is actually some symmetry generator, so that's, that's the case we're going to, to study now. Um, okay. What should I do? Sorry for the shadow. Um, okay, so in, let, let me be brief because this has been mentioned many times. So in Rindler space, uh, we take A to be half of all space. So we take flat space and then our cut looks like this. It goes off to infinity. So this is A 
This is a complement. And then uh, the evolution like this is just rotations. All right, so there's a symmetry that, do, that implements those rotations. And that symmetry I can write in this form as an integral over the stress tensor, t mu nu, c mu, the normal to that surface. Okay, so the normal is just this norm, unit normal vector, like this. Um, and so you can, so I'm writing it like this um, because we're going to come up with other expressions for modular Hamiltonians where they all have this form for various Xs. So Xc is a killing vector. So particular, you know, it's, it's the killing vector associated to rotations. The fact that it's a killing vector just means that it satisfies this equation. Um, and So then, uh, in this case, C is going to be I d by d theta. So if I, you know, if I uh, think about my metric in cylindrical coordinates, d theta squared, and then there's always sort of a, tra a transverse direction the factors out, uh, then C is i d by d theta, which is i. So this i is just because I'm about to wick rotate to real times, and k is really a boost operator. In this case, in this, in this picture, it's a, it's a, it's a rotation. Uh, this is this. Um, and so the fact that this is a, so the fact that this is a killing vector means that you can write a current, j c, c, which is this guy, mu, and this current is conserved, right? And to pr prove that it's conserved, you use uh, conservation of the stress tensor and this killing, killing equation. And so what that means is that if I integrate this charge over here, it's the same as if I integrate it on a different slice I, when I rotate by some angle, assuming something about the stress tensor at infinity. So this is theta one, theta two. So the integrals are the same. So that means that the, you know, this is a time independent problem. Uh, and so I can write this like this. Okay. Okay. Um, so then, so then we have this expression for the reduced density matrix, and then what we can do. Um, So what we can do is, um, right, so this is the reduced density matrix. Now we can start talking about the, the op operators that, that uh, Edward defined. So we can talk about the modular operator, delta, which is then just row A complement inverse tensor rho A, right? Uh, which then, if you put everything together, it's just e to the minus two pi k A hat. So this is, a, I guess, a fairly standard convention now. So k A, I should have said, is only integrated on the region A, okay? So that's sometimes called the half modular Hamiltonian, and it's not the nicest operator. Um, but k A hat is now integrated everywhere. So it's integrated, so k A hat, a hat, you integrate t mu nu over a time slice, c mu normal vector. Um, and so this is really what you mean by boost generator in, in the CFT. Uh, and I should say, yes, yeah, so then when we re wick rotate uh, to real times, this becomes a boost generator. And so the modular operator is just the boost generator. Um, OK, so the, the final ingredient that we need in order to um, reproduce uh, Edward's uh, Tomita operator is we need one, one more ingredient. So let me introduce that now. Um, that's the uh, anti-linear operator, unitary, sorry, anti-unitary operator. 
J. So we need this anti-unitary operator, which is CPT with a particular parity operation. So the particular parity operation um, is such that it sends, so here are my coordinates, now in real time is T and X. Now we have this you know, nice Rindler wedge picture that people have talked about. Uh, the PX is a particular parity where I send X to minus X. So I just send X to minus X, and it does nothing to the other directions. Okay. Can I suggest to call that CRT or R as a Yes, I, 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 yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so what does this do, this uh, anti-unitary operator? Well, it's anti-unitary because of the, the time reversal symmetry here. Um, it takes operators, so there's an action on operators, like this. So I should also say some properties of this operator. It's anti-unitary, so it squares to one. Um, it takes an operator over here to an operator over here in the opposite wedge. So it flips time and, and space, so it goes over here. Um, and so what this operator does is sort of the natural exchange of the two factors. It, it exchanges the A Hilbert space, which is here, with A complement and it leaves invariant the vacuum state. Right. Um, good. So once we have this operator, we can now construct the full Tamita oper operator. Okay, so um, okay, so we construct a Tamita operator, which Edward called S omega as J delta to the one half. And so the question is, why is this true? Um, actually, before before I say that, I, I think maybe I'm I, I haven't motivated this very well. Uh, so firstly, you know. We did really well. We, we produced the density matrix. That's, that's, that's good. But of course, we also know the density matrix doesn't really exist. Uh, and so the, the nice thing is this, is this modular operator. So this is, the, this is nice. And so what we're trying to do here is uh, construct things that are well behaved. We expect to be well behaved in the continuum limit. Of course, we're doing it. Uh, in a way where an intermediate step, we're not in, you know, we, we're regulating in some way. So we might have to put whole, like I discussed there. Um, and at an intermediate step, we might construct this half module Hamiltonian, which is not a totally well behaved operator. Um, it has divergences associated very much like the entangle entanglement entropy has divergences associated to it. Um, but at the end of the day, when we uh, put these two together, the idea is that these divergences will cancel out and you get something nice. And so that's why I'm going through this, because this is something that we expect to be nice in the continuum limit. Um, okay, so to motivate this equation, uh, I'm just gonna motivate it. Uh, let's talk a little bit about modular flow. So modular flow, um, again, using density matrix matrices, is some sort of obscure operation where you take an operator, let's take it to be an operator in this wedge region, and you conjugate it by the density matrix in that region. Oh. To some power is. So this is some unitary operator. Um, so this is some unitary flow, and you know, for general states, if I was thinking about some general state, not the vacuum state or general cuts, then this is an obscure operation. It really is. It's something strange. It, it produces something. A local operator goes to a non-local operator. However, in this case, it's something nice, and this really motivates studying this more. Uh, so here. So firstly, we can make some manipulations 
where because this is an operator in A, I can just add the density matrix in the complement like this, row A tensor, row A complement with a factor of minus IS, row A, And so you know, I pick different minus IS and IS, so these cancel. However, now these are the Tamita operators, sorry, the, the modular operators. So I get delta to the IS or delta to the minus IS. And so this is the, the better way to define modular flow because it uses these delta operators. Um, now, uh, uh, and, and yeah, and the other thing is that we know the delta operator is a boost operator. So we know what this does, right? So in the Rindler wedge, it takes some operator, say T is zero, and it boosts it along a trajectory, uh, one of these Rindler trajectories. So if I start here, then I boost it by some amount S, and then the operator is still local, uh, but it's local up here. Um, so it's a boost. But we also know that the weak rotation of a boost, so if I take S to be a a, an imaginary number, then the weak rotation of a boost is a rotation, okay? It's a, a rotation in Euclidean. So if you like, you can sort of picture Euclidean as coming out of the board here, and what, this, what the weak rotation does is rotate this operator around here. And in particular, if I rotate by an angle of pi, I get over to this wedge region, okay? So, okay, so boost becomes a rotation if I send say s to i theta over 2 pi. And the reason I have the 2 pi is because remember, in the definition of the modular operator, the generator comes with a factor of 2 pi here. Right, so if I raise that to the power i s, then I get k hat. And then this just becomes e to the theta or minus theta k a. Um, and so then if I do that by, by pi, uh, then I get this operator. So pi rotation brings me to the other side. Now this pi rotation, it's a bit subtle uh, because it's really, so in that case, uh, when theta is pi, modular flow looks like delta to the one half. Uh, let me get the signs. O of x, delta to the minus one half. Now you have to be a little bit careful with this because actually this operator is not really well defined unless it's acting on vacuum. Uh, and one way to understand that is in Euclidean, if I start with an operator over here and I start rotating it in this direction, if I had, you know, if it wasn't acting on vacuum, there might be some other operators here. So there's some other, some W over here. And if I rotate this too far, that it crosses this operator, then these operators are no longer ordered in a Euclidean sense, so in the angular Euclidean sense. And violating time ordering in Euclidean is a really bad idea. Okay, so this would violate, in, in particular you get divergences, uh, Euclidean time ordering. Okay, but now we use a property that this operator leaves invariant the, vac uh, the vacuum, and that's just because boosts leave invariant the vacuum. So then this just becomes delta the one half O of x omega. And now we manage to rotate this operator from here over to here. Uh, but there's another way to get an operator over here. Uh, and that is to take the original operator and just reflect, okay? We just reflect using this CPT symmetry. And so that means this should be equal to J 
OX dagger J. And the reason I need the dagger is because this, because of the anti-unitary property of J. Um, okay, so then J also annihilates the state, sorry, it leaves invariant the state. So then you get this equation. If you multiply these two equations by J on both sides, you get this nice equation, which defines, is sort of the definition of this Tamita operator. So just to reiterate, what this equation is saying in Rindler space is that there's two ways to get from here to here. One way is to rotate by pi and Euclidean, although you can only do that acting on the vacuum. And the other way is to use this reflection symmetry. And you, you don't have to act on the vacuum to do that. That's always fine. Um, OK. Good. Uh, are there any questions? Yes. Yes. Um, you mean if, if you move in some particular direction here? Yeah. Like if you try to avoid, no, yeah, no, no, you'll, you'll never be able to do that. Yeah. Um, yes. So in a way, you can, you can start with a general non-local modular operator. Yes. Low to the local one, and there's some futility as you go. Uh, um, I think you might be asking about uh, relative modular operators, maybe, uh, which which is sort of a relation between modular flow of the non could be a relation between modular flow of a a, a lo local region and a non-local. I'm not sure what that means because, it, you know, in quantum field theory, everything is fully entangled. True. So, so I start with two field theories. I want to make them in a, take them to a good state. And in the, this, this modular operator looks very much like, uh, well, you have, a, you have a regular space. You have a half space as your, uh, as your region. And, Right, that's right. What if I have two regions which are not maximally entangled, but I want to entangle them? Um, Is there a way I can use this modular operator? So, so uh, the, um, the, this modular operator, uh, this, this, uh, so, uh, uh, maybe we can talk about it. I'm, I don't think I'll have anything sensible to say, but yeah, there might be something in that. So yeah. let's talk about it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I should have. I should have and specified. What do you mean by Say again. Right, right. But then you are moving the operator to the left and the right. Yes. But O is defined so as to act only on the right and the right. So. Uh, well, I mean, this is doing that, right? So, so at some intermediate step, this is making it, uh, you know, this is now sort of, sorry. The, this operator is acts on the other wedge. So after this guy, this operator acts on the other wedge. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, maybe. I, yeah, I, 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 I think I'm just. You have to be. You have to be a little bit careful with these with these manipulations, and this is one example. Where you have to be careful. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, yeah, so th this, all, all, I'm talking about the structure in the Rindler case, but all of this generalizes to the non-local case. It's a, just a question of whether we can calculate anything in that, in that I would say. And so, you know, I, I've been thinking a lot about trying to do that using things like replicate methods and things like that. So I, I think, yeah. Um, okay. So uh, I don't have much time. Uh, no, no, so O dagger is just the dagger of the operator. I could have taken this to be a Hermitian operator and then this is just the same operator. So the dagger is, is just the usual dagger. It's just, yeah, there's nothing fancy about that dagger. J, J is anti-linear, so you have to be careful because it's anti, an anti-unitary operator, but yeah. Why this is equal to this? In this guy? Yeah, I, I, I have to say I really only motivated this. I think uh, you have to uh, read uh, Bissignan and Wichmann to, 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 yeah. Yes? How much more painful is all of this in the state if it's CPT invariant? Just going to use for any state? Um, well, there's always a J, but it may not be CPT, so. So, so, yeah, so I, I don't know. I, I wanted to talk about one more thing, but I think I don't have time. So let me maybe say some things about general modular flow, because I can do that quickly, and then we can finish there. Um, so people seem to be interested about more general modular flow. So general modular flow. Um, Okay, so uh, now I'm imagining some, taking some random region, A, some random state, psi, and then, you know, in the algebraic language, these operators are still well defined. Okay, maybe we're not totally sure how to calculate them using path integral methods, but they, 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 should, be, they, they should be well defined. Um, and so, you know, some intuition for maybe what happens. So firstly, associated to this region is some wedge, which I'll only draw in two dimensions. Uh, and then if I started with some lo local operator, say, and I flow on that local op operator, so the, you know, it's important, it's really important that this modular operator delta depends on A and psi, okay? Depends on both of these things. So if I flow like this, um, then the, the picture that I have in mind, at least, I, I find this useful, is that this operator is some non-local operator in general, and there's nothing, you know, nothing saying that it's not some horribly complicated operator that lives everywhere in this wedge region. So the only thing that I know about it is that this is an operator, so this was an operator in A, and this is still some operator in A. So it, it maps operators in the A region, in, or the domain of dependence in this wedge region, into operators in that wedge region, but they're, they're not necessarily local operators. Okay, um, that's one thing. Uh, and the other thing is the J operation in this case, which is also well-defined. Uh, well, okay, it, it, it's going to take an operator to an, an operator in the complement region, or the domain of dependence of the complement region. And so, you know, you have some region out here. And so OJ, if I started with OX here, OJ is now going to be some non-local operator over here. Sorry, OJ. Let me write it like this. O of X, which sort of was a local operator, J. Um, okay. Uh, now, one thing that I think is sort of useful um, is, is that you should sort of think that as long as, if this operator I take very close to this, to the boundary of the region, then you, know, it's, you can sort of run the same kind of arguments we talked about for entanglement entropy. The correlations are universal at short distances, so the entanglement should be universal at short distances. So the flows, that's suggestive that the flow should be universal at short, short distances. And you know, so what does the flow look like at short distances? Well, if I go really close to the entangling surface, the entangling surface looks flat, and uh, you know it looks like a Rindler cut, right? A flat Rindler cut. Maybe there's some curvature corrections 
and they could be important, but uh, roughly speaking, this uh, operator should still be an approximately a local operator where you just move it along render flow. So this is some heuristic thing. Th there's actually some papers and theorems to this effect, which I haven't really used or uh, understood uh, very well. Um, I, I should say, we, you know, we have done calculations uh, where, where this sort of is true. So this sort of pops out of the calculation. Um, now, uh, under some conditions. Where true. true. Okay, so uh, I think I'm out of time, so I'm going to finish there. And so, are there any questions?